the environmental use of CEQA litigation against infill projects by NIMBYs disproportionately targets what was once the backbone core of the Democratic Party, poor working class and minority citizens. Oh, you absolutely suck! Today we are going to be talking about this gentleman right here, Larry Elder, who is a conservative political pundit who is running for governor of California in the upcoming recall election. And uh, this is a recent interview, already over a million views. But he said something early in this interview that really got my attention. Let's check it out. Hundred thousand dollars. Somebody with an eighth grade dropout education like my father could not duplicate his path from poverty to the middle class if he worked three jobs. That's because the cost of living has gotten so outrageous here in California, largely because of CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. The California Environmental Quality Act. That enables virtually anybody to stop anything for almost any reason. That's why the average price of a home in California is $800,000. The average price of a home in California is 150% the national average. Uh, and I think I could do something about that. One of the frequent guests I have on my radio program is an economist, brilliant economist named Leo Hanian. He teaches at UCLA, and he says because of CEQA and other policies, the average price of a home in California is literally 50% more than it otherwise would be. I know so Larry Elder is saying that this California Environmental Equality Act, CEQA for short, is largely responsible for the current housing shortage in California. He also mentioned this in an interview he did with Dave Rubin. And they bring their policies with them because they haven't connected the dots. There's a reason why houses are so high. It's called CEQA, the California Quality Environmental Act, that basically stopped any project for any reason for almost an indefinite period of time. In preparing for this race, I talked to a lot of developers and contractors, and the stories they told me. Larry, I had a 2,000 home development project all ready to roll. I got sued. I cut it down to 1,000, I got sued. I cut it down to 500, I got sued. Now it's 200 homes, 22 years later. I talked to one guy who made all of his money. By all right, California Environmental Quality Act. Some people may hear this and think that Larry Elder, he's merely using this talking point as an excuse to toss this beloved environmental regulation in the garbage because let's face it he's really just trying to enrich big oil because he's secretly being paid off by those evil coke brothers Woo! or i guess ju it's just now charles because a few years ago david coke passed away may he rest in peace but nonetheless you guys might be thinking this is just propaganda what does environmental regulation have to do with the sky-high housing costs in California? Well, it just so happens I, uh, I went down the rabbit hole on the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA for short, and its impact on housing in the state. Found it odd that the law was initially signed into law back in the 70s by conservative superhero Ronald Reagan, and that it was actually a Democrat governor, Jerry Brown, who in his last term a few years ago, tried to reform the law uh, in an attempt to speed up housing construction. I thought about maybe doing a more in-depth video on this topic in the future, but now that it appears that this issue could play a role in a, an upcoming election figured why not talk about this right now with uh, the information that I have and I've read a few studies and reports on this issue I'm gonna start off with this one right here this is California's high housing costs causes and consequences this was uh, this was a report from the legislative analyst office LAO this is a, a government, agency in the state of California, nonpartisan, and they are mainly focused on providing fiscal and policy advice to the state legislature in California. So it's nonpartisan. It's not like this is some fringe, wacko, conspiracy, right-wing think tank. No, this is uh, the LAO. This is uh, a report from March of 2015. 
Now, I made some highlights. So you can see right here, as of early 2015, the typical California home costs $437,000, more than double the typical U.S. home, which is $179,000, or at least it was in 2015. California renters also face higher costs. In 2013, median monthly in California was $1,240, nearly 50% more than the national average. And as you can see, this chart right here, California is just crushing, crushing their competition when it comes to uh, high housing costs in the United States. Got the U.S. average down here, got California all the way up here, just smoking everyone. Report goes on to say that oftentimes due to high housing costs, um, it makes it difficult for average Californians. And a lot of times people have to make trade-offs. Uh, like one, spending a greater share of income on housing, postponing or forgoing homeownership altogether, living in more crowded housing, commuting further to work each day. Keep that in mind, folks. Or in some cases, choosing to work and live elsewhere, maybe perhaps fleeing the state of California altogether, which we've seen a lot of stories of that over the last few years. But then we go down here, this report mentions, as you can see, the California Environmental Quality Act requires local governments to conduct a detailed review of the potential environmental effects of new housing construction and most other types of development prior to approving it. The information in these reports sometimes results in the city or county denying proposals to develop housing or approving fewer housing units than the, than the developer proposed, kind of like what Larry Elder was just talking about. In addition, CEQA's complicated procedural requirements give development opponents significant opportunities to continue challenging housing projects after local governments have approved them. Again, this is the LAO, you guys. Goes on to say, many coastal communities have growth controls. Over two-thirds of cities and counties in California's coastal metros have adopted policies known as growth controls explicitly aimed at limiting housing growth. Many policies directly limit growth, for example, by capping the number of new homes that may be built in a given year or limiting building heights and densities. Other policies indirectly limit growth, for example, by requiring a supermajority of local boards to approve housing projects. Research has found that these policies have been effective at limiting growth and consequently increasing housing costs. No surprise there. Check out this anecdote right here. In 2008, a Southern California local government approved construction of a condo tower in its jurisdiction. Following the approval, a local homeowners association filed a lawsuit attempting to overturn the approval on grounds that the project was too far out of compliance with the city's land use standards. During the lawsuit, which lasted around two years, the developer defaulted on its loan for the project site and plans for development were abandoned. In addition, after local government board approves the projects, opponents may file a lawsuit challenging the validity of the CEQA review. As a result of these factors, CEQA review can, time, can be time-consuming for developers. Our review of CEQA documents submitted to the state of by California's 10 largest cities between 2004 and 2013 indicates that lar local agencies took, on average, around two and a half years to approve housing projects that required an environmental impact report. The CEQA process also in some cases results in developers reducing the size and scope of a project in response to concerns discovered during the review process. In addition, lower density luxury housing often pencils out more favorably from a local government standpoint than higher density moderate cost housing. This is because the luxury housing generates higher levels of property tax revenue per resident. 
don't worry, guys. If, uh, if you can't afford housing, well, good news. All this uh, new tax revenue, maybe the government can give you free goodies to help you uh, afford better afford your apartment. Not surprisingly, given these incentives, many cities and counties have oriented their land use planning and approval process disproportionately toward the development of commercial establishments and away from higher density multifamily housing. Local ballot measures on coast have limited development. Many significant land use decisions in California's coastal communities are made by voters. More often than not, voters in California's coastal communities vote to limit housing development when given the option. A review of local election data from 1995 to 2011 found that voters in California's coastal metros took a position that limited housing growth, either by voting yes for a measure constraining growth or voting no for a measure that would allow growth about 55% of the time. Guys, isn't isn't a democracy, you know, policy by mob rule, majority rule, isn't it just wonderful, you guys? No, 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 of course not. Report finally says California's constraints on housing supply, the primary factor driving the state's housing costs, show no signs of abating. And then it suggests uh, major changes to local government land use authority local finance, CEQA, and other major policies would be necessary to address California's high housing costs. Now, again, this is from 2015, and I've seen other reports since from uh, the LAO, the Legislative Analyst Authority, this is from 2017, that also mentions, continues to mention the uh, California Environmental Quality Act, as a serious issue when building new housing. Are you getting all this, folks? Zoning laws, bureaucrats choosing luxury housing over affordable housing for tax revenue, voters getting in the way of new developments, and most importantly, environmental regulation being used as a club to shake down developers. And I'm over here wondering, what happened to all of that unfettered, unregulated capitalism I keep hearing about. Right now, when we have this no-holds-barred, Wild West hyper-capitalism. Blow it out your ass. But let's move on to a different study. This is a study from Holland and Knight in the name of the environment, how litigation abuse under the California Environmental Quality Act undermines California's environmental, social equity, and economic priorities and proposed reforms to protect the environment from CEQA litigation. It's from Jennifer Hernandez. David Friedman, it's not the same anarcho-capitalist economist, David Friedman, the son of uh, Milton Friedman. Totally different guy by the same name. Just, just want to clear that confusion. Before I get people all up in here, oh, oh this is just uh, some, some and crap propaganda. Blow it out your ass. Let's start off with the preface of this report. This report analyzes all CEQA lawsuits filed in California over a three-year study period, 2010 to 2012, to describe how CEQA lawsuits are used in practice. The study demonstrates that about half of CEQA lawsuits target taxpayer-funded projects with no business or other private sector sponsor, and that the most frequent targets of CEQA lawsuits are projects designed to advance California's environmental policy objectives. There's a lot of stuff in this report, but one of the overarching themes is that there's a great irony in the California Environmental Quality Act in that uh, it's a law meant to improve environmental quality, but ironically has been used as a club to thwart construction projects that would, in the long run, make the air cleaner and help reduce carbon emissions. We can see that right here. People who cannot afford to live in California's coastal counties are then forced to live inland where housing costs drop by half or more, but require long workplace commutes since more employment opportunities remain in coastal counties, those who cannot afford to approximate urban housing are then the victims of more NIMBY, not in my backyard for those who don't know, 
NIMBY opposition to transportation solutions such as transit sy systems and HOV lane additions to highways. With residents of inland counties paying far more for energy, for example, more for air conditioning and hotter climates, and more for gasoline as a result of longer commutes, plus fuel surcharges such as cap-and-trade based greenhouse gas pricing increases that became effective in 2015, the environmental use of CEQA litigation against infill projects by NIMBYs disproportionately targets what was once the backbone core of the Democratic Party, poor, working class, and minority citizens. Oh, you absolutely suck! So as you can see, uh, this law has pushed people out of the cities where all the opportunities are. And these people, in order to maintain their jobs, they have to uh, settle for longer commutes, as mentioned in the uh, LAO report that I just cited. But then it, it, uh, it gets a little worse. If you can see right here, the most frequently challenged housing type is multifamily projects, typically multi-story apartments and condominiums. Some of these projects are also mixed use and have, for example, retail stores or office space on lower floors and residential units on upper floors. Every multifamily project within the survey sample was also an infill project, which means uh uh, infill project. Let's bring that up. I just want to get this definition out of the way. Uh, it refers to a building within an unused or underutilized lands within existing development patterns, typically but not exclusively in urban areas. So in an infill development is something that's going to be built on rather unused land. But going back to the report... Climate change policy experts and land use planners love these multifamily mixed use and attached housing product types because they create the higher population densities needed to support transit service and create the promise of a walkable community where people do not need to get into their car to buy groceries, visit a restaurant, or go to work. To further discourage automobile ownership and use, these projects also tend to have fewer and more costly parking spaces. And just as uh, an anecdote, I when I lived in North Hollywood, I did not live in a mixed-use complex, but I did live in an area where everything was in walking distance. I was within walking distance of two 7-Elevens, three Starbucks, a movie theater, multiple restaurants, multiple bars. I was within a mile of a, uh, of a grocery store. I was walking distance from a subway station, which helped me get all around the city at times without use of a vehicle. And I was within walking distance of a bank. I rarely had to use my car when I lived in that area. So I can kind of sympathize with that point. Finally, this study cites uh, an article from the Sacramento News and Review. Someone uh, quoting someone is saying, I am an environmentalist. I attended the first Earth Day in 1970. I supported cap and trade. I want a carbon tax. As an environmentalist, I am ashamed that environmental regulation is preventing low-income housing from being built, is significantly increasing the cost of building in California, and allowing groups to blackmail developers in a variety of concessions and is wasting government resources to negotiate an out-of-control process. So much for the California Environmental Quality Act improving environmental quality. Whoopsie daisy! As an aside, according to this report, the California Environmental Quality Act has also been used as a club by right-wing pressure groups to further their agenda. And anti-abortion anti protesters used a CEQA lawsuit in an attempt to block a Planned Parenthood clinic proposed to be located in an existing building in a neighborhood that already offered abortion services. 
asserting that the city violated CEQA by failing to appropriately consider the noise nuisance that the protesters would themselves create in the neighborhood if the clinic was allowed to open. What a sick joke! Mosque projects were targeted by those not sharing the same religious orientation, and one case included a plaintiff calling itself a patriot group. Now this I particularly have a problem with because while I am a harsh critic of religion, I do take issue with a group calling itself, you know, patriotic, considering that uh, in America we have this thing called freedom of religion. Transitional housing for foster youth who have aged out of the traditional foster home programs on their 18th birthday, affordable housing, and supportive senior housing were targeted with improbable assertions of increased traffic and parking congestion. CEQA has also been a favorable club by labor unions. As you can see right here, construction trade unions were more likely to be identified in petitions than other trade unions, but unions filing CEQA lawsuits typically do not identify themselves as a union. Labor tends to use CEQA litigation and litigation threats to gain control of project job allocations and wages, but also uses CEQA in disputes with other labor unions. In, a, in the high percentage of renewable projects in the Southern California desert that were threatened or sued under CEQA, for example, two different labor petitioner groups, each affiliated with a different construction trade union, each filed their own CEQA lawsuit against the same project. You gotta be fucking kidding. This occurred in a reported dispute over which union would control the jobs created by these projects, and the competing unions used CEQA lawsuits in lieu of using federal regulatory process for resolving territorial disputes. Labor CEQA lawsuits were filed even for jobs requiring payment of prevailing wages and other negotiated terms that are generally perceived as favorable by the community and policy stakeholders. Also talks about non-construction unions are even less likely to be named in CEQA positions in part due to federal law restrictions on the manner in which such unions are allowed to use unconventional tactics like CEQA to bargain over wage and working condition issues with their employers. By far the largest category of these cases involves CEQA challenges to non-union retailers, particularly Walmart. Lawsuits filed against Walmart and similar projects were all filed by local groups with environmental sounding names, although union backing of such lawsuits was well known and open union opposition to such projects was clear in the administration agency approval process. Another noteworthy case involved a union lawsuit against the closure of a luxury clothing store and the opening of a replacement store in a nearby city in a reported bid to avoid the need to organize a union and enroll employees at the new store. But it's not just labor unions. Uh, businesses like hotels have used CEQA as a means to prevent competition from entering uh, uh, the area that they operate in. And as mentioned earlier, taxpayer-funded infrastructure projects like subways and rail have also been thwarted for decades from opposition groups using CEQA as a lawfare club. Additionally, many uh, large corporations, as you can see here, like Google, Tesla, and SolarCity have just cho chosen to, to not set up shop in California because they don't want to deal with the nightmare of CEQA related litigation. And uh, this has actually cost the state thousands of good paying middle class jobs. As you can see here, a persistently underreported result of CEQA's chronic litigation abuse is job loss, particularly the middle class job sector. Job loss from NIMBY use of CEQA lawsuits and CEQA lawsuits more generally, which affects prevailing wage jobs and both construction and non-construction unions, has been documented by various studies. One such analysis was prepared by the, note the noted Southern California economist, John Husing, 
It evaluated seven projects targeted by CEQA lawsuits and concluded that from just these projects, over 3,000 prevailing wage jobs paying workers an average annual wage of $100,000 were delayed or eliminated on an annual basis. The totally affected annual lost wages and benefits of $326 million. <laughs> But I guess all of this stuff about job losses, increased carbon emissions, the stalling of religious institutions and Planned Parenthood clinics, and the stifling of business, this is all besides the point because the point Larry Elder made was mainly focused on the high cost of housing in California. So let's, uh, let's get to that point. Housing developers and agencies seeking to satisfy this market demand and comply with state mandates for higher density transit oriented housing factor in CEQA compliance and litigation costs and delays when pricing projects. CEQA adds to housing costs as the California legislative uh, or office, uh, a source, uh, an organization I cited earlier, recently reported CEQA and other NIMBY opposition, as well as various regulatory and growth restrictions in coastal communities, have caused California's for sale and rental housing prices to be far higher, more than double the cost of any other state in the nation. Report goes on to say NIMBY's comprised by far the largest number of project opponents, particularly for infill projects. NIMBY opponents were often characterized as older or wealthier or less ethnically diverse than the part of the population that would benefit from the challenged project, particularly for urban schools, parks, and multifamily housing projects. As a noted land use expert has observed, the people who are most apt to fight things, have six-figure incomes and nice houses and college and post-college degrees. NIMBYs and their advocates are often personally impassioned about protecting their environment, defining the environment as their local community. Goes on to say, CEQA and housing. Housing is the single largest target of CEQA lawsuits. As shown in figure one, 21% of lawsuits challenge res residential projects. Figure 11, which you can see down here, if you guys are paying attention, takes a closer look at the various types of housing projects being challenged and confirms that CEQA lawsuits most often target high density housing in urban locations, precisely the type of housing that must be built to comply with the current California environmental climate change priorities, such as AB 32 and SB 375. With all this talk about climate change in this report, I get the sense that this is not a, again, some fringe right wing think tank. Then we go down here, the higher density housing, primarily mid rise and high rise buildings typically challenged in these CEQA infill lawsuits already requires home buyers to pay dramatically higher prices for comparatively smaller units. With the exception of the city of San Francisco, however, the Legislative Analyst Office report concluded that housing density increased in California's coastal metro areas during 2020-10 by only 4% relative to density increases of 11% in comparison group that included Boston, Seattle, Washington, D.C., Miami, and even Las Vegas. When the cost of CEQA-related study preparation and processing are factored in, housing costs in California's NIMBY-rich litigious coastal communities increase even more. The LAO estimates that even absent litigation, CEQA and land use entitlement processing for housing projects in California's 10 largest cities between 2004 and 2013 took on average two and a half years to complete and sometimes resulted in smaller projects with fewer units. It even has charts right here talking about um, how California's home prices have grown faster than the U.S. 
and how um, I, I saw this chart in the LAO report as well. I think I forgot to mention this. Between 1980, this according to the LAO, between 1980 and 2010, California's major metros added about 120,000 new housing units each year. According to the LAO, their analysis suggests between 190,000 units per year and 230,000 units per year were needed to keep up with California's housing growth in line with cost escalations elsewhere in the United States. Now jumping back to uh, this bad boy. Again, this was a uh, th this was an analysis of CEQA lawsuits between 2010 and 2012. One of the authors of this report is a lawyer by the name of Jennifer Hernandez. Jennifer Hernandez also worked on this report uh, in the Hastings Environmental Law Journal, uh, which, as you can see, uh, the last report did an analysis of all the CEQA lawsuits from 2010 to 2012. This one did an analysis... Uh, of CEQA lawsuits from 2013 to 2015, saying that the pattern of CEQA lawsuits has not changed, although an even higher percentage of CEQA lawsuits challenges were aimed at projects within existing communities. The top lawsuit targets remain infill housing and local land use plans to increase housing densities to promote transit. 59% of CEQA lawsuits target housing, public service, infrastructure projects, and agency plan regulations. Most CEQA lawsuits target projects in urban population centers, not rural or remote uh, natural preserve. This is important to note because I believe this was, as it mentions right here, this was kind of the purpose of this act was kind of to preserve like natural wildlife and stuff, but it's being clearly being used to prevent the construction of new housing in urban areas where you want to build more housing. The percentage of CEQA lawsuits challenging higher density housing projects like apartments and condominiums has also increased from 45% to 49%. In both databases, the majority of challenged housing projects statewide were higher density structures containing multiple housing units, units like apartments and condominiums, and located in more urbanized areas in regions with higher population densities. CEQA is one of the well-recognized culprits in California's housing supply and affordability crisis. As UC Berkeley economics professor Enrico Moretti, an advocate for increasing density and productivity in urban regions, recently reported in the New York Times, again, not Fox News, you guys, well-intentioned regulations are often used by neighborhood groups to further delay projects. The California Environmental Quality Act, for example, was written to protect green areas from pollution and degradation. Its main effect today is making urban housing more expensive. It has added millions of dollars of extra cost to a sorely needed high rise on an empty parking lot on Main Street in downtown San Francisco. No surprise there. Also mentions that zoning and other legal obstacles to increasing the supply or cost of homes in existing California communities should be critically scrutinized and updated to address the housing crisis. As demonstrated by the profligated use of CEQA lawsuits against infill housing in existing communities, CEQA has pr prominent placement on the list of legal culprits. And she even go, I'm not going to go into the details, but she has a whole section how, how CEQA's legal structure is biased against change and therefore perpetuates historical, racial, and economic segregation patterns that were covered in uh, Ron Rothstein's Color of Law, which I've talked about before in other videos. But this is an interesting point. Because of the uncertainty of CEQA requirements, the time three to five years with some examples extending from nine to 10 years required to complete the trial and appellate court proceedings and the extreme consequences of an adverse judicial outcome that vacates project approvals. Once a CEQA lawsuit is filed, it becomes very difficult for a public or private project to access project financing, bank loans, or equity investors to grant funding. So all of this uh, litigation as a consequence of the California Environmental Quality Act has discouraged investment in new projects that, that might make housing more affordable. NIMBY use of CEQA lawsuits against multifamily infill housing to project the character of their community too often used as a code word for excluding those people 
should have been roundly condemned by environmental advocates who routinely espouse a commitment to equity and environmental justice. Instead, support for anti-housing nimbyism remains firmly rooted in the environmental activist world, prompting Professor Enrico Moretti to resign from his multi-decade membership of the Sierra Club. So you even have former Sierra Club members, again, not, not exactly the Cato Institute, uh, recognizing the destructive impact of the California Environmental Quality Act. And the uh, Jennifer Hernandez, if you read the conclusion, she mentions that she has attended Hillary Clinton fundraisers. So again, this is a... Uh, Pretty left-leaning sources that uh, that I that I think I'm reading. The housing crisis has already resulted in a, in severe poverty rates, homelessness, and the diaspora of racial communities to ever more distant locations. To use climate policy generally and seek was specifically to change a fee or otherwise require an unquantifiable unqu unquantifiable level of mitigation for every mile traveled for those forced to drive until they qualify for housing, they can rent or own clearly precisely the type of disparate impact highlighted in the decades of discrimina discriminatory policy, government policies in color of law. For big projects that require multiple approvals over time for each phase, more CEQA is generally required for each phase and projects can be sued again for each phase. For some projects, these duplicated, duplicative rounds of CEQA lawsuits sometimes span 20 years and 20 lawsuits or more. While the magnitude of costs increased to housing prices caused by paying higher wages and benefits to construction workers are disputed, the, the low estimate prepared by union advocates, housing costs increased by 12%. In a middle range, as reported by UC Berkeley's program on housing and urban policy concluded that the prevailing wage Wages, often uh, demanded by unions who, who use CEQA to shake down developers, added 9% to 37% to construction costs, and a 48% construction cost increase was reported by Beacon Economics in, 26, in a 2016 study of a prevailing wage ballot initiative enacted in Los Angeles. Use of a putative putatively colorblind law like CEQA to extract labor agreements continues to a regrettable history by some unions to seek economic advantages for their members at the expense of African Americans and other minorities who along with younger Californians are desperately impacted by California's housing crisis and CEQA's structural basis in favor of the status quo. Again, uh, citing uh, consequences and color of law. To allow housing projects to be derailed by NIMBY and labor lawsuits while shielding its own office building and sports venues from CEQA lawsuit delays. This is something that Larry Elder has been talking about, how new housing units aren't being built. Meanwhile, big new sports arenas uh, for professional sports teams are being fast-tracked and greenlit without any CEQA delay. Shines the brightest of lights on why the much publicized legislative housing package of 2017 will do little to nothing to get more housing built. And as the governor noted, will actually increase housing costs at a time when housing is already unaffordable to average California households. So long story short, CEQA has been a total disaster when it comes to the construction of new developments particularly housing, and is a huge reason for California's housing shortage and sky-high housing costs. Remember this next time some huckster tries to tell you that it's all because of something like unfettered, unregulated capitalism. Right now, when we have this no-holds-barred, Wild West hyper-capitalism... Blow it out your ass. Now... There is some good news. In May of this year, just a few months ago, goofy-ass Gavin Newsom signed SB7 into law, claiming that uh, it cuts the red tape for housing developments and will expedite CEQA review processes for new developments, which, again, normally take two to three years, according to all those studies and reports I just cited. So, uh, problem solved, you guys. <laughs> 
course, that's something I might save. This dumb law did not come with a bunch of ridiculous strings attached. First off, when it comes to housing, it only applies to housing developments on infill sites uh, that have an investment of, of a minimum of $15 million up to $100 million. And it mandates that new projects don't result in any net additional emission of greenhouse gas emissions, including from employee transportation to and from the site. And it mandates that such projects offer prevailing wages for all contracts and labor related to the new developments, which if you recall that last report I just talked about, increases construction costs anywhere between 9% and 48%. So, and it does not appear to eliminate the potential for litigation from pressure groups like NIMBYs, unions, and environmentalists, because if you remember the uh, one of the reports I cited, even when unions are promised prevailing wages and benefits, they still use CEQA as, uh, as a club to, uh, to file lawsuits to compete with other unions. So, really does not sound like this new law is going to accomplish much. But Larry Elder seems to at least be aware of the destructive impact that CEQA has had on California's housing market for decades. And if Larry Elder somehow claws out a victory in the upcoming recall election, hopefully as governor, he finds a way to give the California Environmental Quality Act the brutal death that it deserves. <laughs> <laughs> 